Dynamic Means, and uh, I've been invited here today to tell you a story, <laughs> to read you a story. I'm going to read you to you from The Education of Mrs. Brimley. It was my first book that was published. It's a Victorian historical novel, and I'm going to tell you the whole plot right now. It's a Victorian striptease. But to prove that that's the whole book, let me read you the, the, uh, the back cover blurb. Emma Brimley believed no harm would result from claiming to be a widow. But when she arrives at New Yorkshire as the new teacher at the Pettibone School for Young Ladies, the innocent miss is horrified to discover she's expected to prepare her students for the intimacies of marriage. Consequences will result if she loses her post as a teacher. In desperation, she turns to the alluring, annoying, and strictly forbidden neighboring artist. He might be the titled retrobate with a reputation fit for whispered gossip, but Lord Bedchambers might also be the only one who can help her. Lord Nicholas Chambers, black sheep of his family, needs a model for his entry into the Royal Academy's exhibition. He offers the new teacher a scandalous bargain. He'll answer her questions about anatomy and bedroom etiquette if she poses for him. For every question answered, she must remove an item of clothing as his model. But what started out as a game of wits quickly becomes a game of the heart. And Mrs. Brimley may not be the only one getting an education in the sweet rewards of seduction. Now, this book, let me tell you a little bit about this book before we read it. As I said, this was my first book. And I was really shocked and amazed to find that it went up for auction uh, for three New York publishers when it was uh, when it came out. Uh, and it also was turned into a manga, I think I'm saying that correctly, edition in Japanese, which just blew me away. I can't read a word of the book, but that somebody would take my characters and produce a book, a graphic novel. Uh, with the story, it was just great. The hero doesn't look anything like I envisioned him, and the heroine cries all the time, which I had no idea. <laughs> but, you know, in a graphic novel, uh, you don't know what they're going to pull out. Well, let me, let me read you some. This is where they determine the bargain. Uh, so you kind of know what's coming. But Miss Brimley, and notice the miss, because before this point, she had to explain to him, to the artist, why she needs to know these things. After all, she's a widow. She's dressed like a widow. Why would a widow not already know? So she's already explained that she's faking it and that uh, she's a virgin and she has no idea what to teach these students. She thought she was going to be teaching them English. Uh, and so, Miss Brimley, you may recall that the girl I hired to pose for me has not materialized. She nodded. Indeed, you thought I was she earlier. You have need of information, and I have need of a model. He smiled, reassuring her that his moment of displeasure had indeed passed. Her hopes lifted. Perhaps we can design an agreement, he continued, that will satisfy both our desires. You wish to paint my portrait? Pleasure rippled through her. Great ladies had portraits painted. She could bend to this arrangement, especially if it required more time in his presence. I wish to paint you naked. A devilish smile played about his lips, but I'll settle for painting you in a thin gown. Sir, shock paralyzed her. Surely you don't mean it. He positioned himself in front of her. In exchange for information, he added. I've never been so insulted. She tried to step around him, but he continued to hinder her exit. Again, she regretted the absence of her fan. She would have thrashed him with it. What kind of a woman do you take me for? She cried, frustrated at his attempts to thwart her. A comely one, I suspect, beneath all that black. Using the tip of his walking stick, he lifted the hem of her skirt an inch off the ground. Sir, shocked, she slapped the material back in place. The man was incredulous. A bemused grin played about his mouth. He was playing with her, she realized, feeling the stab of disappointment. She had fooled herself into thinking this dandy was different, yet it was all mockery. Pain burrowed deep. I refuse to be the subject of your jest. Her lips tightened, her eyes burned. She tried to push by him, but he caught her arm. There is no jest. 
If only that were true. She looked away, frightened, of, afraid that he might see the yearning in her eyes. Her throat tightened, making words difficult. If you meant to compliment me, I assure you, I meant no compliment. Her head swung around, capturing his gaze, his brow lifted. I was merely stating facts. His ridiculous statement confirmed the joke. She jerked her arm from his grasp and turned her face from his scrutiny before beating a hasty path toward the door. Think of the girls, he called behind her. How are you going to prepare them for their marital duties without my assistance? She paused. Logic slowed her retreat. The headmistress was to observe her class in the morning. Do you have so many resources that you can abandon the one readily available to you? His voice wove through her thoughts like rhyme through a stanza. Indeed, that very lack of resources had inspired her visit in the first place. If she couldn't turn to him for answers, where could she go? She kept her back to him, but listened to his calm, insistent plea. How can you mislead those young, trusting girls at this crucial juncture? She ignored his light mockery. He might not believe her dedication to her students, but then he wasn't familiar with the events that had brought her to this wilderness. Now that she was here, she could never go back. First, however, she must prove to the Higgins sisters that she had knowledge of a carnal nature. You would answer all my questions about intimacy? She asked over her shoulder, hesitant to be reminded of his handsome visage. No matter how difficult and with complete honesty, the difficulty, I expect, will be yours in the framing of the questions. His voice moved closer. The exposed skin on the back of her neck prickled in response. She imagined he was an arm span away. Yes, I will answer all your questions, he said, completely and truthfully. She turned to face him, surprised to find him even more closer than she had estimated, uncomfortably close. She studied him anew, mentally assessing her adversary. The London Popinjays had always underestimated her intelligence. Although it pained her to place him in that category, she suspected he would do the same. If you answer my questions first, she hesitated to emphasize her sacrifice, I will pose for you. You must think I'm daft, a smile tilted his mustache, and he raised one brow and shook his head. After I fulfill your needs, what assurances do I have that you will fulfill mine? You have the word of a lady, she said decisively, although in truth, she suspected she could avoid meeting his demands. No, I don't think so. His eyes narrowed. He tapped an idle rhythm with his prop on the wooden floor. She bit her lips, suddenly wondering if she had been the one to underestimate him. She studied him anew. Let us strike a bargain, he said, overlapping his hands on the top of the silver knobbed cane. My needs are for a model to pose in the Grecian fashion. You, on the other hand, require answers to questions of a personal nature. He stepped closer, engulfing her in a subtle atmosphere of forbidden magnetism. She could almost taste his determination in the shared air between them, but she refused to give ground. I propose that I will answer one of your questions. His raised finger almost touched her nose. For every item of clothing, you remove as my mom. Her knees threatened to buckle. Surely he could not desire her. By her uncle's estimation, a scrawny scarecrow devoid of a woman's charms as a model. She had been, she was no beauty. To suggest otherwise was cruel. I will pose, she said, pushing her spectacles further up her nose, but only fully dressed. I cannot paint what I cannot see. A dimple flashed in a smile. Sheer willpower kept her frown from uh, kept her from smiling in response. Chambers' intense gaze raked her form as if fact belied his words. Never had a man regarded her with such intent, certainly not one as handsome and refined as this. His voice, soft and seductive, surrounded her with the rich scent of warmed brandy and his own unique essence. He lured her much like the famed mythological sirens. Lord help her, she could happily drown in this assault. I need to see how light and shadow caress a woman's curves. Immediately she imagined a physical heat flowing down her chest and swirling around her waist and hips. 
her mind insisted that modesty called for distance between them, but her feet refused to move. I need to judge how proportion is modified by the angle of the pose. Emma thought of the painting she had viewed of women languishing in forest bowers, bending to some trivial task. Even if she were fully attired, those poses would be too risque to consider. Still, her insides quivered at his indecent proposal. Chambers turned abruptly, releasing her from his enchantment. She slumped slightly, catching her breath while he strode toward his easel. I will draw a picture of an aroused man's private regions if you will remove just one article of clothing. She should run. She should escape now while she had her dignity, and yet I have already removed my cloak, she said a bit short of breath. He smiled a subtle gesture, and I have already shown you a picture of a naked man. She considered a moment weighing the advantages and disadvantages of compliance. A boot, she announced. If I had a button hook, I would remove a boot. However, as it's unlikely that such an instrument will be readily available uh, in an artist studio, Chambers stepped over to his desk and returned with a long hook fashioned from a metal replica of a woman's leg, complete with garter. Perhaps this will help. It's a good book. <laughs> I hope you give it a try. And I also, besides writing historicals, Victorian historicals, I also write Victorian paranormals. And actually, I'm reading Bound, a piece out of Bound by Moonlight, which I wrote right after uh, The Education of Mrs. Brimley because I didn't think anybody would ever buy The Education of Mrs. Brimley. But indeed, they did. And it's a best-selling novel. So let me tell you a little bit about this one. This one, the opening, I'm not reading the opening, which I love because I think it's like a scene from a Disney movie, the way it starts. Uh, my, ooh, let me reach in the blurb so you know what I'm talking about. A woman of extraordinary talents. Lucinda Havishaw turns invisible in moonlight. Just her, not her clothes. She can't help it or prevent the process. It just happens. The descendant of a rare race, her ancestors have been burned as witches, persecuted and tormented as the devil's children. She must be careful to avoid detection. However, as her family has no other means of support, she reluctantly sheds her petticoats and corset during a full moon to prowl the gaslit streets of London, stark naked as a thief for hire. A man with a dangerous mission, the only tools British spy and master safecracker James Locke needs are his hands and his brains. But when a hand tremor threatens his mission to secure a list of agents for the crown, the accidental discovery of a lady thief with an extraordinary secret may just be his salvation. However, as James and Lucinda discover, there's more than one kind of trouble to be found in the moonlight, the kind that begins with blackmail and ends with a kiss. Now, the section I'm going to read to you is from chapter two. And James Locke has seen the evidence of Lucinda's uh, ability to open up a safe at night and be invisible and, and, and not be seen, and see the necklace fly across the room. I figure you can see that if you go to Amazon <laughs> and you read those pages. But he has tracked her down and he approached her in disguise, changed his name and uh, offered her a deal to go recover a pocket watch. And he's going to pay a lot of money for this pocket watch because it's a dear heirloom and he, and he needs it back. And she needs the money. So she decides to go for it. And this is what happens. The pocket watch wasn't difficult to find. In fact, the moment she opened the door to the library, a glint of moonlight flashed on the engraved gold where it rested on the desk. The lid was open as if someone had just checked the hour, but the desk chair was empty and no light other than that from a single window behind the desk illuminated the room. Her sense of spell never worked quite as well when she was in full phase, but she recognized the scent of candle wax, peat, and something else something familiar, but out of place. She hesitated, caution suggesting she turn and flee. Still, the watch beckons so close at hand. She only need grab it and go. She glanced quickly about the room, not able to see deep into the shadowy corners. The current owner was probably asleep in his bed, 
unaware that a stranger had penetrated his domicile. She stepped over to the desk, picked up the watch, and gently closed the lid. However, before she could take two steps toward the door, something fell from the ceiling, wrapping her in thick, heavy ropes. A trap! Panic! She dropped the watch and ran, but her legs entangled in the foul-smelling webbing. She lost her balance and fell to the carpet. Her worst fears realized she fought the knotted ropes pressing into her tender skin. She choked back a cry, pulling at the heavy threads, seeking an end to the encompassing snare. A match struck and yellowish light filled the room. I hadn't expected you quite so soon, but I'm glad you came tonight. She gasped, recognizing the low, mesmerizing voice. Mr. Langtree? Her gaze swept the freshly illuminated corner. He had exchanged the unfashionable tweeds for more appropriate evening affair attire. The bushy mustache and eyebrows had disappeared, as well as the thickness cluttering up his middle. But the eyes, those intelligent ass assessing eyes, those were the same. His lips, now free of the burdensome mustache, lifted in a superior sneer. Her initial fear hardened to anger. The devious son of a cur. Once she escaped from the stinking fishnet, she would cause havoc on his person every moonlit night for the rest of his life. She jerked the biting ropes out from under her and tried to slide beneath them to the side. Surprised, James quickly um, glanced quickly around the room. He heard her voice, but where could she be hiding? And how did she control this writhing, unnatural entity trapped by the ropes? Miss Haversham? He advanced into the center of the room, searching the areas that still clung to the shadows. You can come out now. The net undulated with the shifting from beneath. Amazing. He could see straight through the wave of movement, clear to the other side. How do you do it? He asked, his awe evident even to his own ear. There's no thread or wire. I can't see a thing, even in the light. There was no answer, no reply but the bulge in the net slowly rolled toward the side, approaching imminent escape. Without hesitation, he sprawled on the wave, overpowering it with the weight of his body. We'll have none of that, he said, feeling its struggle beneath him. Not until my questions are answered. Lord, that sweet exotic scent fairly surrounded him, overpowering even the rancid scent of the ropes. Miss Havenshaw must be near. He gasped one of those smaller ripples, uh, he grasped one of the smaller ripples and discovered something that felt a bit like bone. Get off of me, you lying, deceitful blackguard. The hot breath of her curses burned his neck, bringing with it the realization that Miss Havishaw did not control the creature. She was the creature. The delicious discovery both stunned and thrilled. She thrashed beneath him, not an entirely unpleasant sensation, arousing thoughts of this she-cat similarly trapped in his bed caused him to momentarily forget the purpose of the encounter. However, a rope knot pressing into his increasingly sensitive groin brought him around. I'm not going to hurt you, Miss Havishaw. He moved his hand to the spot he approximated to be her shoulder. Instead of a fabric-bound collarbone, his fingers pressed into a soft, warm mound with a fleshy peak that extended between the ropes. She gasped and instantly stilled. All his senses turned to the fingertips that circled and explored the pebbling peak. His groin tightened, not needing to see what his fingers instantly recognized. Take your hand off my breast, Mr. Langtree. You're naked, he said, his body responding with acute awareness and tantalizing pressure. Common sense whispered that he should withdraw his hand, but sense, common or not, abandoned him. Her lungs expanded against his chest as she gulped for air, driving the enticing nub deeper into his palm. Her position suggested her hips, naked hips, would be perfectly situated for penetration. His hardy manhood signaled it was up to the task. Sweet heavens, if only he could see, to, uh, see her to tell if desire swept through her features the same way it played havoc with his. If only a quick blow to his privates ended all thought. He groaned and rolled to the side, curled in a ball like a babe. Lucinda was somewhat surprised at the effectiveness of her instinctive knee jab. 
However, once relieved of the weight of his body, she easily crawled out of the cumbersome neck. Free of his fiendish trap, she looked back at the motionless Mr. Langtree. A vague sense of remorse tugged at her heart. She couldn't recall ever having purposefully injured another before. Though instinctively wanting to flee, she hesitated. Will you be all right? No answer. Mr. Langtree? Still silence. She bit her lip, not wanting to leave him alone if he needed the doctor's attention. She took a step toward his back, curled like a protective shell. I'm leaving now, she said. Of course, he wouldn't know if she was leaving or not. She was careful not to make a sound as she crept closer, avoiding the rope webbing. She had bent over his head just to make sure he was still breathing when his arm lashed backward and grasped her ankle. She cried out as she fell. He let go of his hold, but it was too late. She had lost her balance and crashed on top of the Persian carpet. He crawled alongside of her while she gulped for breath. Miss Heavenshaw, may we call a truce? Truly, I have no wish to harm you. I hadn't anticipated. He pulled himself to his knees and removed his jacket. He held it out to her. Take it, please. Even though I cannot see you, I understand that you might feel a certain disadvantage. If I wear your jacket, I shall lose my only advantage. You'll be able to see my location. She struggled to slow her breathing, assuming that was how he knew precisely where to offer the garment. For the love of Jupiter, she should have run out the door when she had the opportunity. His eyes crinkled and a smile teased his lips. A pair of handsome lips, she noted, now that they were free of the mustache. I assure you, he said, still a bit breathless, I could find you even without clothing. Another fun book. I encourage you to, to give it a shot. I hope you enjoy these. If you are interested in reading more of my works, which I sincerely encourage you to do. Oh, I should mention this, The Education of Mrs. Brimley. It's the first of a series of three books. And Bound by Moonlight. Um, it has a novella that has the same invisible, a similar invisible heroine placed in modern times. Don't you kind of think when you go out and you see a full moon now, you'll have a different, there could be people out there, invisible, you can't see them. Anyway, I invite you to come to my website, www.donnamacbeans.com. Uh, while you're there, please sign up for my newsletter. I do give away books, and um, you'll be the first to find out about upcoming books coming out, uh, character interviews. Uh, I also interview authors, different things like that. So uh, please come and visit. Uh, and I hope to see you there. Thanks so much for spending some time with me.